This is CHSR 97.9 FM here in Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada. This is Python's Paradise, your film and music show, and this is your host, Greg Gilbert, a.k.a. the Python Hyena. And folks, Friday the 13th Part 2 came out in 1981. I would have been nine years old when that thing came out. And uh, I have somebody who's everybody remembers is hanging upside down. In fact, uh, I'm told he's in his office, but I think he might still be hanging upside down. (laughs) (laughs) Folks, I bring you the wonderfully talented Russell Todd. How you do, Russell? I'm doing great, Greg. Thank you so much. How are you? I'm doing great. Have you ever been out in in New Brunswick, Canada way before? Actually, I have, yes. Wow. Uh, I know someone, uh, I don't know if he still has a home there, but it has a home in New Brunswick. I believe on a lake. Okay, Crystal and Lake. It was so, uh, I, I did go go there once before. Yeah. Oh wow, yeah. Like I I just got out of New Brunswick for my first time for horror rama, and it's, it's like I didn't want to come home. But I always test my listeners if they know where we are because I always say I, I have a feeling like we're in that niche part of Canada and nobody's familiar with, but we're one hour ahead of like Toronto and places like that. So. <laughs> Most people don't realize there's yet another time zone that's that, that's there beyond you know the New York time zone another hour later. So uh, yeah, I found that fascinating. Yeah, so people always question that. I thought you were three hours ahead. No, nope, we're four. Four, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Friday the Thirteenth Part Two. I got to start you out with my story on this film. Because it got a big laugh from Adrian King, Melanie Kinnaman, and Lara Park Lincoln, anybody I've shared this story with that I've interviewed from the franchise. And uh, I saw this film before I was 18 because my cousin's my older, an older brother baited me into watching this, and I was afraid of scary movies. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I get baited into this, and uh, we got into about three kills into it, and then Kirsten Baker strips her clothes off. And it was the first time in my life I had ever recall seeing a naked woman. Oh, how funny. <laughs> yeah. And that was where my mom rushed in and turned the television off. <laughs> Watch the kills, that's fine, but na- nakedness, that's no. Funny, yeah. Sex is bad, but murder is okay. Yeah, and I remember later on, my cousins managed to sneak in and turn it on, and I, I, I ended up watching the rest of it because I just wanted to see the killer get his, get his, uh, uh, you know, get his defeat. And, and of course, by the end of the movie, when we're, we're driving home from my cousins, and I was like petrified because it's like he came through the window. He's still out there, you know. Right. That's- <laughs> it, it wasn't until I watched the final chapter, which ended up not being the final chapter, that I got to see this thing get its defeat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you never know. Yet they'll still try to do another remake. Um, uh, probably not a sequel, but a remake. And, um, and he'll be alive again. Oh, yeah. But uh, back then, of course, Jason didn't have his iconic hockey mask. He had that that uh, burlap sack over his head from, and I don't know, I kind of think that made him look a little bit scarier. Yeah, I mean, I guess it is scarier. It's it's kind of a makeshift kind of thing he did. Um, but it seemed to work. I mean, people were very, very frightened, without a doubt. Yeah? yeah. Well, how how did you get the your part for the film? Did you, just a standard audition? Well, I saw, you know, the, the theatrical paper called Backstage, Mm-hmm. So there was it's a newspaper, and uh, I don't know if it's still around today, but I saw the the call for it in the paper, and I thought, wow, well, I saw the first one. It was scary. I enjoyed it. Let me go up on that. So I submitted myself. I don't even think I had – maybe I had just gotten an agent at that point. Um, and so, But I submitted myself, and I got a call to come in. And I read, I believe, with Steve Miner, the director and the casting agent. And I don't even think there was a callback. I think that uh, – you know, a few days later, I, I received the call saying that they wanted to hire me for the job and that we'd be shooting up in Kent, Connecticut. Was it okay if I was, you know, yeah, on the road for a while? I said, are you kidding me? Of course I want to do this. <laughs> and um, I just thought it was so cool to be, to 
the uh, you know in the sequel to that film that scared so many. And of course, at that point, no one knew what kind of franchise it would be that would keep going and going and going. And, and uh, even today, I mean, people still stop me from that film, and I'm always amazed. How do you recognize me from that so many years ago? Uh, but it's really held on, and, and you know, it shows on TV almost every Friday the Thirteenth, or there's festivals, there's all sorts of things. Uh, I, I I go to fan signings where it's just mobbed with people that love that franchise. So uh, yeah, it was a very uh, uh, lucky moment to to get cast in that film. Do people recognize you right side up? <laughs> <laughs> they say, "Can you turn your head just a little?" <laughs> Blood rushing to your face. Hide your head. <laughs> what was it like working with Steve Miner as a director? He was great. He was very relaxed and cool and and, and funny. Um, never really raised his voice. Um, it was creative. He let us, you know, be a little goofy at times, um, and he kept us together as you know, like like a captain would on a ship. And uh, you know, really good memories of him and and, and working with. Uh, the way he worked with the, the entire cast and crew. You know, I'm hearing things like um, um, Sean S. Cunningham, of course, directed the original. What part did he play in the sequel? Because I'm hearing that he was involved or not involved. or I don't really remember how he was involved in the sequel. Um, hmm. I, I really don't know. I can't, I can't answer that. Well, Steve Miner was the one director that did two of the films, and and, of course, brought Adrian King back from the original. Of course, Walt Gorney, who played Crazy Ralph, brought back. Did you, did you see, uh, did you meet either of them? Uh, met Crazy Ralph, yes. <laughs> and and who else did you say? Adrian King. Adrian, I never met Adrian. No. Of course, he was oh, in yeah. that scary opener. Yeah. How, yeah, yeah. how Jason found her, we'll never find out. <laughs> yeah, who knows? <laughs> who knows? They take liberties. What what was uh, Walt Gorney like? Oh, he was a character. He was a, he was a very nice guy. I only had, you know, it was a very brief meeting, but um, nice guy. Um, and uh, just kind of down to earth. Well, your big famous scene, of course, you were the prankster who would, would uh, take that uh, elastic and slingshot rocks at poor Kirsten Baker's hind end. And, of course... Uh, you ended up getting it back when you, of course, stepped into the wrong sneer and you're hanging upside down. What was that process like? So it was actually quite interesting because they said it's, it could take a while because we have to get you upside down, of course, and, uh, and get everything set in place. Um, but prior to that, uh, my friend John Caglione, who's a special effects makeup artist, in fact, he won the Academy Award for Dick Tracy many years ago. Mm-hmm. He, he had molded my neck and created a foam latex piece uh, that they, he attached to my neck that day. And they had pre-slit the, the, you know, the mark for where the machete would come across my throat. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there was tubing going through it, and it went down my entire body, down my legs, and out uh, the bottom of my pants. Of course, I'm upside down, and so there's a guy above me. They hang me up off this rope in this tree, and there's a guy above me with a big tank, like a pressure tank, and he's pumping the blood on cue. So <laughs> I'm upside down, everything's in place, and you know, two guys from the crew are kind of holding me up so I'm not totally upside down while they're getting things in order. Um, you know, we wanted to do it in one take because once the blood started going, it would be a mess. Um, so uh, they got everything set, the camera rolled, uh, Jason comes over and, and, and puts the machete, grabs my head, puts the shed machete against my throat, but of course, it, I don't know if you know this or what fans tell me all the time, it's the wrong side of the machete. <laughs> he, he used the dull side. By, I don't know if it was by mistake or, or planned that way so I truly wouldn't get cut, but everyone notices it and, and points it out to me whenever I run into, into fans. They say that about Tom McBride's death with a uh, machete to the face and the wheelchair as well, the wrong side of the machete. Oh, really? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah. So the guy, you know, so the, Jason put this machete against my head, the throat. He holds my head, and I kind of let's pull it backwards to reveal the slit as he's doing it, and then they start the blood pumping. Um, the blood was pumping so fast that it was just pouring down, you know, went past my chin, went past my mouth started to go into my nostrils and then in, into my eyes, but they cut really quickly in it because the rest of that was not usable because of, you know, 
at that point, I was not choking, but it was just <laughs> getting into my nose and into my eyes. Uh, so they cut quickly once the blood starts flowing. But uh, it was a cool process. But the, my funny story about that, it was, it was my last day of work yeah. in my death scene. And I remember calling my parents that morning and saying, it's my last day of work. And uh, they were very excited that I was on the show. Um, but, you know, today's my death scene. And they said, Russell, why did they save your death scene to the end? I said, well, you know, things are usually shot out of order. But in this instance, you know, they shot it in order for my character. She goes, are you sure this isn't a snuff film? <laughs> I said, well, Mom, Dad, I, I, it's Paramount Pictures. And they already released one. It was a big hit. It's a sequel. I don't think they're doing a snuff film. <laughs> but uh, they really thought that. Yeah, I mean, they brought back Adrian King and cr cr Crazy Ralph, and their characters are killed off. Maybe your parents might have <laughs> been onto something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just think, well, why did they save it to your last day? Are they really going to kill you? <laughs> I, said, I don't think so, Mom. No, no, that's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah, and of course, um, you worked with Steve Dash, of course, who played Jason, and... Um, I know he's done a convention up here in Halifax, I believe, you know, but I haven't ever gotten him on the show. What was he like as Jason? Uh, also a nice guy. Um, you know, I don't remember much interaction with him, mm -hmm. uh, but he seemed to get along with everyone, and uh, he enjoyed playing the part very much. He, you know, he, it's, it's the star character of the film. Yeah. Uh, so he, he knew that, and, and that we know made it even more interesting and exciting for him. Uh, but he got along well with everyone. Well, I definitely have to ask you about Kirsten Baker because I'm going to tell you, there, like I said, every time I see her, it's like that's the first person I've ever seen nude. Uh, I often wonder what she would think of that. Um, <laughs> oh, she's got a kick out of it. She's really down to earth, too. And I, I just saw her because we just did a Friday convention uh, in the Midwest. And I hadn't seen her since the movie, which is a long, long time ago. Uh, so it was great to see her and, and Amy and John and some other people from the show. Um, but uh, she was a blast. She was, she was so much fun, and uh, we got along great. Um, and, and she would get a kick out of your story very much. In fact, next time we do a convention together, I'm going to tell her your story. <laughs> Could you? Could, would it be ever possible too? I mean, if it's all right, I would love to get some of these people on my show. Well, I, it's funny we didn't exchange contact info, but next time I do a show, yeah. I'm sure she'll be there again, and uh, I will give her your contact info, which I have. I I, I think it would be hysterical to share that story with her. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, she got a kick out of it. She would think it's very funny. How did she um, get ready for a scene? Like, I hear stories about women doing nude scenes. Um, some prefer doubles. But I, somebody had shared a story with me that she actually did this and was a pro about it. Yeah, I, I mean, she was a total pro. To her, it didn't matter. Nudity wasn't an issue for her, and uh, nor should it be. And, and she was just very cool. You know, she knew what she was getting into when she took the part that there was a, a nude scene. Uh, I felt badly for it only because the, that lake was freezing. <laughs> I like when you do a, a shot. Uh, I did a commercial once where I was in a water tank. Well, they heat the water for you. Yeah. Well, they can't heat an entire lake. So when she was in there, she, she was very, very cold. Uh, but the entire, you know, she didn't say it had to be a closed set or anyone. The crew, well, obviously the crew has to be there, but it wasn't like, you know, no one else could be there. Uh, but it was at night. Um, and... Um, so now that you know everyone was around at that moment, uh, but she was a, she was a total professional. Yeah, she still have the uh, the Mickey Mouse t shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I loved her in that film, and of course, everybody loves Amy Steele. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, she's great. Yeah, Amy's a very nice woman, uh, and I'm glad I got to see her too at this signing. I'm not sure uh, if she's still. I'm not sure what she's really doing in her personal life currently, but um, but she's great to hang out with and a uh, very very sweet lady. Do you think uh, John Fury's character Paul? Uh, what what do, what do you think his character died, or do you think that he just thought that you know Jenny was just too much of a pain in the ass and he took off while the going was good? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if he was smart, he just took off while the going was good. <laughs> I 
mean, you got to question the whole premise. Why are we returning somewhere where all these people were killed before? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's kind of strange. I always wonder why we went back. Um, but, yeah, he probably just took off. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did get. He, well, he, he tried to give Jason a fight. You know, I don't think too many uh, um, actors uh, since then, other than maybe the odd, oh, you know, Tommy Jarvis in Part Six and uh, and John D. LeMay in Part Nine. Not many of them give Jason much of a fight. No, we pretty much just go down and die. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it's kind of tough when you're when you're immobilized, but um, yeah, it's. He sneaks up on you. You're pretty well a goner. Well, we know that Bill Randolph and Marta Kober did not get seconds on dessert. Did you get seconds on dessert? <laughs> Will everyone know what you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, they did sneak away from camp. They did. Yes, and that was their punishment. I love that. No seconds on dessert for Jeff and Sandra tonight. <laughs> <laughs> there always has to be punishment. Yeah, so, so so they got to at least have first. <laughs> you know, I got Bill Randolph on Facebook, and I've tried to reach out to him, and he's never responded. I find that funny when somebody's on your friends list for like a couple of years, but they, of course, had, uh, he and Marta had that, that um, uh, scene where they're shish kebobbed in that bed. Yes. And I heard that that nearly gave the film an X rating. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you don't see much about during their sex scene. You know, it's, it's, it's pretty benign. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, one, once again, in all horror films, you know, if nudity and sex equates with you must die, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's crazy, but that seems to be a formula. You get any memories of, um, of Bill and, and uh, Marta from the film? Nothing really specific. It's been so many years. Uh, just that we all got along really well. We were all, you know, extremely young and, and excited to be there. Great location up in Kent, Connecticut, doing the sequel to a well-received, you know, horror picture. So, uh, you know, it was just a very positive feeling for everyone, and we liked, we all liked each other genuinely, and um, no attitudes. Just, just, just having fun together, making a movie. Oh, Kirsten Baker gave you attitude. <laughs> <laughs> not, not off camera. <laughs> so who did Muffin like more, you or Kirsten? Um, I think me. <laughs> yeah. Dogs like me, and I'm good to dogs. Well, well, Kirsten wasn't dancing with you. At least the dog was. Right. <laughs> Don't forget, I was striking out with everyone. Yep, that's what, that's, that was the dialogue. That was the line, yep. Now, Stu Charno, of course, I always visualize him as the smart one in the film. Who to think that being after uh, being at an after hours bar would save your life? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you should promote that to too many people. <laughs> <laughs> nope. But it did him. He, he, it, did, it did save him. Yeah, it was a wise choice. I was actually surprised by that because it, he had a lot of screen time. Very funny as Ted. And uh, I love that whole tow truck scene there, the the beginning of it there too. Oh, right. Very very funny, but it, it's it was so interesting that uh, that he stayed behind. He got to live because normally that doesn't happen with characters with a lot of screen time. That's true. Usually, yeah, unless you're the star that lives to the very end. Yes. Uh, but yeah, so maybe maybe he was very happy about that because he would think, well, maybe I'll come back in another sequel. But, I don't uh, know. No, no, I don't think that's happening. My idea, I think that all of us from that film should come back as the parents of the kids, of ourselves. Yeah. Since we all look like the kids, since we are them, but we're the parents now many, many, many years later, and we come back to kind of put closure to it. Yeah, and well... Something happens again. But, there's been... Uh, I don't think Paramount's going for that idea. You know, they were supposed to start another one recently in the Carolinas, I think, or in Virginia or somewhere, but it shut down like weeks before it was supposed to start. Yeah, I know. They, I heard it was because the Rings movie didn't do well. What does that have yeah. to do with Friday the 13th? Well, again, they thought maybe just the whole genre was taking a hit and people weren't as jazzed about, you know, the genre, and so why put something else out there? Um, I think that was the thinking behind it, but... 
not 100 percent sure well somebody was saying that what they'd like to see happen is get all the heroines together to go after jason i think they tried someone wrote that i believe yeah i'd like to see that yeah especially since they all still look good <laughs> right <laughs> that's good yeah i mean amy Steele's definitely aged well oh yeah she looks fantastic yeah yeah went through a lot of uh, uh physical stuff in that film yes she did i'm sure it was grueling for her <laughs> do you got any memories of tom mcbride a lot of people ask about him of course he's passed away unfortunately but he was of course the guy in the wheelchair he was tom was a very very nice guy uh he he laughed a lot i remember that about tom he liked to joke and, and laugh a lot he had a good nature and true as you say he unfortunately passed away too young um but uh, yeah, he, he was he was a very kind, uh, nice guy. I actually thought he was actually in a wheelchair, but I actually thought a, fo- a still photo of him out of the wheelchair. So I guess that was written for the character, huh? Yeah, that was not part of who Tom is at all. No, it was, it was just the character. And of course, Lauren Marie Taylor. Who can forget her? She actually did a movie with John Belushi and Dan Aykroyd that year called Neighbors. So she was on a roll that year. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, and I also saw her at this signing, and uh, she also looks great. Time has been very good to her, and uh, very sweet. And, and I remember her being a lot of fun, too. Uh, you know, we were all so young, as I said, you know, making this movie. And, um, you know, some of us are really at the start of our careers. And so just, just we we're all, again, very positive about being there and, 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 and having fun, and we, we had a blast. Is there any, um, like, I know you said you had a blast, but was there any, like, parts of that film that were problematic to film, not just for you, but for anybody that just stand out? Um, well, you know, you're not always there for a lot of the filming. I mean, mm-hmm. you're there on location because you're not going to send you back and forth. We were, I was living in New York at the time, mm-hmm. in Connecticut. But, you know, it's not your scenes unless it's the group scenes. You're back in your cabin or doing something else. Um so I don't remember anything specific about standing out that was difficult to do. Um, I remember, which I've spoken about before, I, uh, it was scary walking back from the set each night from the actual lodge on the lake to our cabins because you had to walk down this long, long path that was just lined with tall trees on both sides. So you couldn't see anything. It was, and, and it was usually at night, of course, which I most of this at night. Um, and... It was dark, and, and the moon was out, and it was just kind of spooky in and of, of itself. And you would walk down this path at night after you wrapped, and invariably every time there would be another cast member or one of the crew members in one of those bushes, those trees along the way, going, kill, 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 kill. <laughs> or, or something else from the film, or, or jumping out at you. And, and you knew you were making a horror movie, so you knew it wasn't real yet you would still be spooked and, and your heart would be racing when someone would do that. And you know, so I'm going to kill you for doing that. And, and, uh, but it happened so often to all of us. So, I could uh, just imagine it happened to Amy Steele a lot. <laughs> 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 After all, she did run, run there and then he, uh, Jason leaps out at her and she just gets out of the way. <laughs> Oh, I know, yes. <laughs> quick move. A quick move, yeah. No, I, I, I saw this film at a young age, and like I said, it left an impression on me. First nude scene for me. That was the first time I ever noticed that males and females were different under the clothes. So I, I don't know who it was that said it, but one of the actors as I interviewed from the franchise says, leave it to old Jason to, to, uh, to make an education out of these films. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's good. You learned something. Yeah, there you go. Not something that my, my mom wanted me to learn that young. But, uh, At that age. Do you, do you remember much about the uh, the premiere of the film? Oh, like, I, I don't. You know, like I said, so many years ago, I don't remember what I had for breakfast today. Oh. <laughs> but um, I really don't remember the premiere, no. Have you heard other things about that? Well, the only things, like I heard a lot of, I don't remember anything from the premiere. I remember things being said from the film. Like I know Amy Steele accidentally split Steve Dash's finger. (laughs) Really? Yeah. Yeah, I heard about that. But um, 
but no, um, I, like I said, I would have been nine when that film came out. So, uh, and I, I don't know what age I saw it. Must it might have been eighty four or something like that when I saw it, which would have been shortly after, because my uncle owned a video store at the time, and these were the kind of films I was not supposed to be watching. But somehow, <laughs> but somehow we all get to sneak in those type of things somewhere. Well, my older brother made an argument. He said, if you can watch Conan the Barbarian and all the bloodshed, why can't you watch a Friday the 13th? And he did kind of have a point. Yeah, that's true. That's but, true, yeah. But the thing is, Jason wasn't fighting Conan. <laughs> he was fighting John Fury. <laughs> uh, anyway, before you did uh, Friday the 13th, you was in uh, He Knows You're Alone, which was... The first film for Tom Hanks. Yeah, and I feel awful. Whatever happened to him? I don't know. Whatever. He, he just dropped off the map. He did. <laughs> and, of course, I only worked one day on the film. I never met Tom or anyone else. I was just with the girl, and as, as you probably know, coincidentally, I died the, almost the exact same way. Well, I did it the exact same way as in Friday the 13th. Maybe that's why they hired me for Friday the 13th, because I die well upside down with my throat slit. <laughs> I don't know. But that was also just a backstage call, and I saw it in there. I went in and read it, said, you're hired. And it was just a very brief scene, the very opening of the movie. And the, it's a movie within the movie, which you learn right away. Uh, I'm with making out with a girl in the back seat, and we hear something, and I go, I leave the car and go check to see what that noise is. And then she's in the car, and time goes by, and she's, she's wondering where I am. She's calling my name, and she's going, where are you? And she comes out of the car, and I'm hanging upside down above the car with a slit throat, and the noise she hears is my ring hitting the tapping the top of the car as I'm swaying back and forth dead. <laughs> so um, that was my first time dying that way, and then I guess it was good enough that I <laughs> did it again for Friday the 13th Part 2. Have you died that way since? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me think. No, 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 no. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, after that, you did Where the Boys Are, 84, which, of course, changed genres for you. Yes, yes, very much so. And, uh, Alan Carr produced, Hi Averback directed, TriStar Pictures' very first release. Yeah. And, um, of course, a remake of the original uh, with Connie Francis of Vet Mimu, Jim Hudden, uh, who was Tim Hudden's dad. I played his role. And that was a great experience. We shot in Fort Lauderdale for a while. Um, so much fun. It was a place I had gone for years as a kid because my grandma and grandpa lived in Fort Lauderdale. So I would go down from New York for all the holidays. Uh, but it was it was great. I mean, uh, it, was, it starred with Lisa Hartman in that film, who I enjoy very much, and Lorna Luff, Lynn Holly Johnson, Wendy Shaw, Alana Stewart. And... Um, others, of course. But uh, I had a blast. A great part, a lot of fun. I got to, uh, well, it's not really me singing in the film, <laughs> Let the Truth Be Out, but I uh, had a great performance at the end of the show where I'm singing to Lisa to win her over. Do you hang upside down? No, I didn't still <laughs> hang upside down in that one. I didn't die. The critics might have killed us, but I didn't die in the movie. You actually got a, 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 a Razzie win or a Razzie nomination out of that. It was a nomination, yes. I didn't even know what the hell those were at that point. I, you know, acting was so new to me, obviously. And, uh, and <laughs> it's still a, a laugh today when, when people mention that. Actually, but, you know, some people consider even winning a Razzie to be like a compliment now because now, like, Sandra Bullock is not, like, shows up and accepts hers, you know? So it's oh, actually, I know, yeah. Some, some big stars have gotten them. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, no, I did not win, but I was nominated. I forget who actually won that year. Uh, well, I know they went after uh, poor Lynn Holly Johnson bad one year. I don't know whether it was that year, but <laughs> oh, was it for the uh, Ice Castles? Yeah, I don't, I don't remember, but I know, I know they went after her bad. I think it might have been that year because she was in that Michael Caine movie. I think too. Uh, oh, what was it? The one with Michael Caine and Demi Moore? I, I forget what it is now. I'm not sure, but. Uh, it might have been her in that. I, I might even have my information wrong on that. But, but uh, poor Lynn Holly. May, maybe it's what happens when you're pretty blonde. Everybody's jealous. <laughs> I guess she was a very pretty blonde. Yes. <laughs> now Lorna Luft is, of course, the daughter of uh, 
of Judy Garland. I mean, that must have been interesting. It was. It was. Yeah, she has some great stories about her life with her mom. And then um, she's a real professional. You know, she's done a lot of things. I don't, I don't know if she's still acting today. I know she performs. She sings at various venues, as Lisa Hartman does. You know, uh, Well, I, Lisa Hartman doesn't. I don't think she performs at all anymore, but she's married to Clint Black. And then, of course, uh, you went from uh, uh, Where the Boys Are 84 to Chopping Mall. That's another classic. Actually, that film uh, is, kind of, is becoming kind of a cult film. Uh, there was a screening of it, I think it was last year, here in Hollywood at, at the Egyptian Theater. And the entire house sold out with fans. And it was amazing. And they brought pictures for us to sign and people wearing T-shirts and posters and I mean, it's just amazing how many people love that. It was a it was a kitschy film, but it was really well done by a, a great guy and director Jim Wynorski. and um, and we shot that at the Sherman Oaks Galleria, which is no longer the Galleria. Now it's a bunch of what well, was the movie theater there and a couple of stores and things and a gym, but mostly it's offices. But uh, we would go there when everything closed at night, and we would work all night into the morning. And here we are, a bunch of people running around with AK-47s and, 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 and trying to kill these robots that were trying to kill us. And they do kill many of us successfully. <laughs> uh, but it was a fun action picture to do and to be in this mall that I would shop at all the time, as just a, you know, as the public uh, does, and, and, and to be here at night now destroying it. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, a lot of fun. We, we had a good time. I had the pleasure of having Kelly Maroney on my show I back know, in May. I know, I heard part of that. Oh, you listened to it? I did. Oh, wow. Yeah, I I loved um, having her on, and uh, she was a delight. I don't have that one up on YouTube yet, but it is up on the CHSR site. And, uh, man, what, what a chipper person. Had her on to talk Fast Times at Ridgemont High and for its 35th anniversary, and we talked Chopping Mall and... Uh, I really like her. She, she's a delightful uh, young lady. And uh, what, what was she like for you to work with? Everybody is delightful? She was. She really is. And that's just who she is. We, we just did a fan signing together a few months ago here locally. So we got some time to spend together. And she's everything that she's just a real person. And, and she loves what she does. Seems to love life a lot. Um, uh, yeah, I like her very much. Yeah, you had some really interesting people in that. Barbara Crampton was in that. Yeah, Barbara, yeah. John Treleski, who now directs. Yeah, and you have Per Bartell and Mary Warrenov, Dick Miller, some of these people from the Joe Dante uh, section of town. Yes, yes, they've been around. Yeah. A good, a good group of people. Uh, again, a lot of fun making that, that film, and I'm glad that that too, like Friday the 13th, is has legs. It's, it's really uh, has longevity, and, um, and people get excited about it even today. And, of course, uh, one of the last things you did was called Border Shootout. And, um, I'd not seen that, but I thought I would bring it up. That was a Western I did with Glenn Ford. Mm -hmm. Just to know I was going to be working with Glenn Ford was very exciting. You know, he's, he's iconic. And we shot that in old Tucson. I believe the sets that whole town had burnt down after we, I mean, years later after we had shot this, so that's a shame. I'm sure they've rebuilt it. But, you know, to be this character, I, I was a bad guy with a good heart who realized he was bad and kind of he kept, comes around by the end. And this was a TNT movie. Um, but his name was Jordy Clegg. And uh, to get in that garb, those war, that wardrobe, those costumes, immediately put you in the right headspace and character. And I love putting on that duster every time and, 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 this, and the, the holster with the guns. And it was just to be in that setting was, was really amazing. It was like a, a, a kid's dream come true to do a Western. And uh, my death scene in that one, it seems like I always die in everything. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> except in Where the Boys Are, I didn't. Um, my death scene was I come out and I have this big shootout. It's me against a number of people, and it's in slow-mo, so it's even more exciting. But, of course, you, we did that in one take, too, because of the squibs I had attached to my body, the electronic charges that release the blood and blow open the clothing. Mm -hmm. So um, they call action, and you know, someone is shooting in every direction, and I'm doing this stuff, and I'm thinking, I hope it's working right, and 
and I take my final hit and I go down and my legs go up and then I hit the ground in this sprawled out bizarre position I ended up in and they yelled cut and uh, I hadn't didn't see any of it until it actually you know aired and I was like wow that really came out great I was really excited by how it it, it, it uh, the final print um, so I was very happy with that do you have a favor of your movies favorite movie um, I would say it was where the boys are that was my first real starring picture Alan Carr was terrific. It was it was great to me. Uh, enjoyed working with Lisa, Lorna, Wendy, Dan McDonald. Um, be back in Fort Lauderdale, where I was as a kid so many times. It was just a great experience. Uh, my parents came down and watched some of the filming, so that was a nice enjoyment to, to share it with them. So uh, what was it like uh, doing a starring role from previously doing supporting? It was a bit nerve-wracking at first, uh, you know, but then you settle in and uh, you get comfortable with the people and what you're doing. Uh, but I felt, I felt pressure in my first starring role. And it came, you know, still very new. I mean, I hadn't done a lot before that either. But, um, and you know how that part came about. My picture was in a, well, this, this guy that cut hair, it was, he cuts it from his home, but he has, you know, actor's pictures on the wall. And someone had recommended I go to him, so he cut my hair. He said, why should you put your picture up here? And soon after, Alan Carr walked in there and had his hair cut. I said, who is that? And Jerry said, that's Russell Todd. And, and he says, he's going to star in my next film. <laughs> so it wasn't that easy. I had to go through auditions with Lisa and with the director and, and for TriStar. And I did get the part, but um, but that's how it all came about, just like, you know, from a picture on a wall. Wow. And he didn't cut your hair upside down. <laughs> no. <laughs> you're just, you're just, you're not ever going to leave that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I bet you, you probably get hounded over the upside down thing a lot. People do, yeah. They ask me <laughs> about it, what it was like. Um, uh, and, that, and a lot of people, as I said, notice that the machete was backwards and they asked if that was intentional or not. But uh, most people stop me today uh, from a soap opera I did. I, I was on, I started for three years called Another World. Where I oh, yeah. Dr. Jamie Frame. Yep. And yeah, you replaced another actor. I did. Well, it's funny. I did replace another actor, but I was the tenth actor to play Dr. Jamie Frame. Oh, I don't remember that. The show went off, I think, two and a half years after my contract expired and my character went to Paris to a doctor's convention and never came back. Okay. At the end of my contract. Um, but soap fans, I mean, horror fans are incredible. They really are. But soap fans are the ultimate fans. They, and the reason is simple because you're in their room and you're in their home five days a week. Yeah. Like they truly know you. Uh, even though it's a character, they know they don't know the individual, but they feel they truly know you. And they're amazing. They're just, they're so devoted and dedicated to the soaps. Well, I, my mom watched soap operas, you know, but um, but I I remember that character because I remember Joanna going was going with Jamie Frame character. <laughs> I oh, just really? thought she was really cute. <laughs> yeah, I my my uh, girlfriend on that show was Anne Hache, who oh, was, uh, okay. played Marley on the show, uh, and um, so that's at that point that's who who I was opposite. Yeah, and but, Anne Hache you still see today. Yeah, she's done quite well for herself. Yep. Yeah, excellent. As an actor, and she's done some directing, too. So you don't act anymore, do you? I don't. I actually gave that up after the soap opera, and I came back. I was actually on an audition for a commercial, and my friend, uh, who's another agent, uh, he said, you know, I'm starting to work for this below-the-line agency. We represent directors, photographer, photography, production designers, customers, editors, and they're looking for someone to work in the TV department. I said, well, I, you know, I don't really want to be an assistant. I don't know what that's about. Uh, you know, I just came off the show. I don't, just meet them. So I, I met them. And the woman that owned the agency was really vibrant. I liked her a lot. I thought the people there were cool. And, and be, you know, it would be nice to learn a new business. So I started to work as an assistant for the head of the TV department. And a few weeks later, I was at the front desk. And a gentleman walked in and he said, do you represent Steadicam operators? I don't think so. I don't know if anyone does that. Let me get back to you. So I researched it, and I realized no one did in the industry. So I started the first department for Steadicam operators anywhere, as far as I know, in the world. 
and I had about 10 clients I located, and it became very, very successful at that agency. And it grew to about 15 people, and then I thought, well, why don't I just do this on my own? So two years later, I had left that agency and opened my own company, and, and I've had my company 16 years uh, representing Steadicam operators, and we just started a new division. We now represent drone pilots and operators as well. Oh, wow. Someone else takes care of that, but uh, so we, we you know, spread our wings a little finally. And, uh, and I love it. I don't have to worry about what I look like when I get up in the morning. I don't have to worry about memorizing lines. No. Yeah. I love my clients. I love the industry. I'm still in the industry, and I'm very happy. It's been it's been a, a great business for many years. Well, yeah, we did, get, of course, get to see you on Crystal Lake Memories. I've had Peter and Bracky on here, and, of course, I've had Scotty McCoy on here, who, of course, um, I was talking to last night. So, uh, oh. and, um, yeah, so there's a lot of people interested, especially in the Friday the 13th franchise. It's, it's kind of interesting how that has branched out. Who would have thought when you were making part two this was going to become so iconic? What do you think of that all these years later? I think it's just fascinating, and, and I'm very grateful for it, and it's true. I mean, I knew the first one was was successful, and I enjoyed it, and I was thrilled to be in the second one. And at that point, you just have no idea. This could be the very end, and you're just doing your movie, and it's over, except for the residuals. <laughs> <laughs> they keep coming, which is nice. What, do you, um, what movie do you make the best residuals off of? Uh, I tell where the boys are. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, Friday the 13th, though, is is perpetual because it's always showing. Uh, but the residuals, you know, it's not a great amount of money by any means, but it's, it's continuous. It'll probably end up being the best. Um, what, part two or where the boys are? The part, part two will probably end up being the best because it's continuous. Where the boys are doesn't show anywhere anymore. Okay. Occasionally there'll be something that trickles in, but it, it, for a while it was the best. But now I would say Friday the 13th part two. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, because I hear some of these horror stories, especially about independent... Uh, people like I heard about this when I was at Horrorama from a couple of people that that um, they don't get the residuals because of some of the crookedness that gone on into making some of these independent movies. So, oh, I bet. I yeah. Bet problems and and well, that's why you have the union to fight for you. But regarding Friday Thirteenth, you know, my death scene was lifted and put into Part Four, I believe. Yep. Uh, so in the opening of the movie, you see my death again. And they were, I would do residuals for that from the time the film was first released. And I had, a, I had to go back and forth with Paramount for a while uh, because they said, well, you, you know, you're not in it. I said, what do you mean I'm not in it? This is it. And I even gave them the, the, the time codes. <laughs> I had to go back and forth. It took quite a while until they finally said, oh, yes, that's you. We owe you residuals. <laughs> yeah, they owe every one of the cast. Yeah, that now I finally get residuals for both films. Well, that's a plus. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, again, we're talking very little, but it, but it's great, you know. Well, now, how often do you do the conventions? I haven't. I did one in LA uh, maybe six months ago, and I, and just a few months ago, I did one in the Midwest. But I hadn't done a Friday convention. I mean, it's been I think ten years, fifteen years since I've done conventions. I just didn't really have the time. Um, so it was quite terrific, actually, to get there and meet the fans again, and especially the Friday fans. Do you ever get uh, anything? In, what's some, like the most interesting thing you've ever been asked to sign? Uh, someone's chest. <laughs> this woman asked me to sign above her breast. Her chest. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, people have held out their arms to be signed. Of course, that eventually goes away. Um, or they tattoo it on them. Yeah, some people probably do, yeah. Yep, I've heard those stories. Yeah, but I had someone at this last convention that must, because I'm like, I was like the last actor to be caught to sign their, their posters or, or their books or things because they've been to other conventions, and most of the Friday Part Two guys are, and women have, have been to you know, the conventions. They do this circuit, but I don't. So here I was, the new person who they hadn't gotten my signature, so it was pretty amazing, and you know, the line was crazy to get my signature uh, on various things. Um, so it was a lot of fun to meet the people. And they're just genuine and they're excited. And, and uh, you know, I'm very grateful that, that, that they're so enthused about uh, meeting me and, and, and about the, the franchise. Do you ever see any of the part two people today? Well, just at the convention. 
just at the convention. Uh, but other than that, uh, not socially. Um, you know, we all have separate lives and, and separate friends, and uh, and perhaps some of them hang out together. But I, I just haven't. Uh, I just think that you know it happens when when we're called in to do these conventions. So you haven't stolen any more of Kirsten Baker's clothes. <laughs> Has none left. <laughs> <laughs> Ever see Kelly Maroney anymore, or just at conventions? Um, well, I saw Kelly at the uh, Chopping Mall screening. Yeah, great. Uh, and um, but usually not, not, not really. But yeah, I mean, it, it, this is a really a small town. Oh. I mean, you write, you do bump into people, so I'm sure I will again. Well, we're coming down on that 45 minute mark, and I know you wanted to. Uh, to get back to work and uh but uh, i appreciate you coming on here and talking about friday the 13th part two and and uh and uh kirsten baker's uh, missing clothes and hanging upside down <laughs> yeah if you bump into any of them they're they're more than welcome to come on my show i'm the the door is always open but i will let them know oh yeah but i was gonna say before i i let you go i was wondering if you'd do a plug for my show okay okay you ready yep okay shoot Hi, this is Russell Todd, and I hope you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise. Oh, wait, wait, let's do it again. <laughs> Go for it. Hi, this is Russell Todd from Friday the 13th Part 2, and you're listening to Greg Gilbert on Python's Paradise in New Brunswick, Canada. God bless you, Russell. I, I hope that your business does well, and I hope you can hope you continue with success. And, and uh, it was a bright spot having you come on here today. Thank you so much. Let's my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me, Greg. It was a lot of fun. And uh, keep hanging in there. <laughs> <laughs> I will. <laughs> God bless you, man.